I'd uh, like to begin with a prayer so we could remind ourselves of God's presence. Mighty God, we put before you all of our efforts to deepen our understanding of our faith. Pray your blessings on all of our study and learning and teaching. We're grateful for all of the fruits of the Second Vatican Council, and we pray that we have the courage to maintain its spirit. And we offer that prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, um, I want to welcome everybody uh, here for this series. Um, uh, this was actually Dr. Richard Gillardi's idea a long time ago to concentrate on the Second Vatican Council. and when I got a call from the Blade today saying that, uh, sort of unaware of our series, was saying they wanted to think and do something about the Second Vatican Council since it was the anniversary of the beginning, I thought, well, we're on target. So uh, I suppose the secular world as a whole will be in some ways uh, remembering this. Uh, so the whole series is devoted to Vatican II and uh, the years that have followed and where we have gotten to uh, since then. Um, and I also want to thank Ann Abbott. I don't know if Ann is here, but she's responsible for getting Daniel Berrigan to be able to come, and so I'm sure you don't want to miss him. And one of the perks of holding a series ticket is that we will save you a seat uh, for Berrigan lecture right up till 5.30. And after that, you're on your own. <clears throat> but uh, so, uh, and then... Um, also, I must thank Sister Shannon Shrine because um, Sister Barbara Reed, who was doing the second lecture on Scripture, cannot be here. And uh, Shannon, being the generous person that she is, uh, quickly agreed, then wondered what she had done. <laughs> then further went and agreed to do the same topic that Barbara was doing, reminded me that I now owe her big time. So. <laughs> So anyway, Shannon, thanks. She'll be right here next week uh, doing the lecture, and we appreciate that. In 1966, a young priest in uh, Tanzania wrote a letter to his bishop. And he said to his bishop, I've been here about a year now, and uh, we've had our missions going and this structured activity and so on. And he said, as far as I can do, it produces, see, it produces no results. We have uh, zero numbers of people from the Maasai tribe that I am uh, ministering to who have decided to become Christian or who follow it out at all. And so in the letter to the bishop, he says, I'm going to adopt a wholly different strategy. I'm giving up all of that, and I'm just going to go out where the tribe is. They were a nomadic tribe. I'm just going to go there and go to small groups of that tribe and tell them the stories in the Bible and the stories about Jesus. And that is exactly what he did for the next 17 years. And he made a lot of mistakes. He went in and uh, told the story of Adam and Eve in a garden being blessed by God. Well, the Messiah didn't like that because they hated farmers, people tending gardens. They were a nomadic group, so he dropped that story in a hurry. And he told them the story of Abraham 
how God uh, called Abraham to go out from his land and go wander around and really search for the great high God. And he told them that uh, that's what they needed to do was to search for the great high God. They were believers in one God, the God who took care of the Maasai tribe. And so his strategy was to engage them in conversation about uh, the great uh, God. And uh, he asked them, and the first response he got from one of the warriors, this is a tough warlike tribe and uh, uh, tough initiation rites. And those warriors were um, strong and courageous and brave people. And the first response he got to the question, well, you know, tell me about God. He says, if I see God, if I meet him, I'm going to put a spear through him. It stopped him in his tracks. He began to, you know, begin to think more about, you know, God and the problem of evil and suffering and how people can be upset with uh, God. Throughout all of this, this missionary was learning a lot how to interact with the people. But I like that story of Abraham. And then he got, after a while, he talked about uh, to Jesus. And he told them the stories about Jesus. And in the tribe, they, uh, he would adapt the stories to their customs and the Maasai tribe to, to sort of, in a way, let somebody back in with you. You spit on them. Seems like strange to us, but that's how they express that. So he told them this wonderful story of, uh, of a father who had a son who took off and uh, didn't uh, function properly and messed up his life. And... Uh, decided to come back and the father went out looking for him he watched for him all the time and he got back and he spit on him and they had a party and they began to understand something of that story and when he finished telling them all the stories about Jesus that he wanted to tell them he says that's it I'm leaving now only one step yet we'll um, if you want to, you have to decide if you, if you want to be baptized. And we would do that. But I'm going to leave. He made a very conscious decision that he wouldn't tell them the part about the church and how the church functions and acts and how it's organized and what it does and the doctrines it developed and the moral rules it had. And so he wasn't going to tell them any of that. You just let the stories out there. Let them ponder what that all might mean to them. And he was constantly worried about putting on an overlay on the stories. He didn't want to interpret the stories. He just wanted to tell them as bare as he could and let them sit there and let them ponder it. And even when he decided, uh, and they decided they wanted to be baptized, small communities, um, he would uh, do the simplest of rituals, just the pouring of the water and nothing else. And he would let whatever else would happen develop. I mean, little customs they would have and bring into the baptismal ceremony. And then he tells about coming back at times to tribe and celebrating um, the Eucharist with them. He says he was never quite sure when it began or when it ended. And it got celebrated in different parts, and it took a long period of time. He would begin by taking a bit of grass as he approached the village. And of course, grass was crucial to them. They were uh, nomadic herders of cattle, and the grass was crucial to their life. He would take a bit of grass, and he would hand it to the chief, and it would be passed on through the village. And then dancers would assemble in one part, and they'd begin to do their ritual dances. And they would sing songs, all songs they picked, all of it, all these rituals, things that they incorporated into the whole ceremony. And then they would decide, the elders would decide if, uh, whether they would actually celebrate the Eucharist or not. If someone didn't pass on the grass to somebody else, there's a good chance they would decide not going to share the bread and wine today because we hadn't achieved the kind of reconciliation. Many things began to change in the Maasai groups that uh, he evangelized in that way. 
They used to chain the old people to the trees and uh, let the wild animals devour them. And the tribe began to keep the old elders in the community and attend to them as they died. The women began to be treated in a different way. He tells the story how warriors never ate in the presence of women. Warriors would never do that. And one time when he's celebrating the Eucharist with them, he takes the bread in the community and hands it to a woman near him. And she handed it on to a warrior near her. And a whole a different understanding of the Eucharist and what it was all about developed. Tells the story of one of the chiefs that was so close to him and one of the first persons he ever talked to. When he was baptized, they took new names. And he took the name Abraham. The nomadic one trying to find the high God, the great God. Well, in a sense, the story is, the priest is Father Vincent Donovan. The book is Christianity Rediscovered. It's an epistle from the Maasai tribe. It's a wonderful story and uh, beautifully uh, written and uh, many insights into the, uh, that's on your notes, by the way, if you're looking at all the books and things I'm referred to are on your notes, handouts. The, um, in a sense, the story of Father Vincent Donovan and the way he approached his missionary work uh, sort of pulls together what uh, I want to talk about in, in this lecture. Uh, I'm talking about it, uh, the Second Vatican Council is a springboard to the world church. That's very much taken from my mentor Karl Rahner great German Jesuit who, when he was in the United States, gave a lecture, probably the most famous lecture he really ever gave, most quoted, you see it all over the place, on the theological significance of the Second Vatican Council, in which he began to investigate um, what he thought was the root meaning of the Second Vatican Council, very different from interpretation commonly accepted up till that time. But I want to look at Rahner's work in, in a larger context of uh, the church in the new world in which we live. And the new world in which we live um, often can be, is characterized as postmodern. Um, it's, uh, I like the word because it means very little. It's almost totally empty. <laughs> The word means anything anybody wants to make it mean, but I like it. It's like the word God. The word God is a good word because it gets filled out. I mean, I don't know what it means. It means whatever our experience brings to it. So I like words like that because they invite filling in from our own experience how we perceive the reality. And there's ways in which the world just has changed. Um, it changed for many of us in the United States with the assassination of President Kennedy. The world never quite looked the same to some of us after that time. For our young people, I think, um, as one of my students wrote, uh, everything is different for her. Not a day goes by that she doesn't think about September 11th and all that that means. And so the world takes on a different shape, a different form for us. Our consciousness gets changed. And in the postmodern world, a lot of the simple optimism <coughs> and the black and white approach to life, um, the uh, sort of assuredness that we had it figured out and knew who we were and where we fit and how we could manage it all, that is gone for many people. And we live what, uh, with sort of a radical vulnerability, as some have called it, a radical vulnerability in which uh, our essential security is somehow now at stake. Carries with it not fear, not only fear from radical vulnerability, but we have anxiety over it, angst 
over that. So uh, there's a postmodern mood that's around. And in the postmodern world, we get a whole lot of relativity going. You know, here in the academic world about deconstructionists who warn us the way any one interpretation of a text could be sort of have a dominating effect. So you have to keep that open-ended on what texts actually mean and that different people interpret it in different ways. You can't set down any one meaning of that text. And in that postmodern world, um, the whole sense that it had a center somehow, whether that center was New York City or Tokyo or Rome, begins to break apart. And the world seems polycentric. It's like there's a whole bunch of centers out there. It's hard to figure out where the center really is anymore. It all gets fragmented and pulled apart in various ways. And again, that seems to contribute to uh, this uh, deeper sense of radical insecurity that many people feel in that world. And in this, uh, this world is... Um, post-colonial. I mean, we lived a long time in the Cold War with two superpowers controlling the whole of the world. And as we have to deal with these days and dealing with our Muslim friends, um, to recognize uh, the horrible sense of uprootedness that they have known as a result of colonialism and their own empires getting carved up and these little nation states that it's easier for the West to control. Get that out of the Muslim sense of humiliation because of the way the world has changed in the, throughout the modern period. And so a lot of that goes to create a, a mood mood in the world, in the sense that uh, the world is harder to control than we ever might have thought. The random violence and the terrorism just contributes to that, it seems to me, and intensifies it. We live in a world where we talk these days about globalization, become a familiar word in the theological vocabulary, especially out of the world of economics where globalization suggests that there's uh, economic interests that work in the world, often that transcend nation states. So multinational corporations seem to have a certain power that even goes beyond the ability of nation states to control. We get more of a sense that, different, that we are interdependent, that the various cultural units in the world can't survive just on their own. Samuel Huntington wrote The Clash of Civilizations, that the Christian West and uh, the Muslim East are on a collision course, just can't live on this one globe without coming into conflict with one another, each group having adherent billions of adherents, followers on this one globe. So that there's an interplay between the various forces, between nation states, between cultures, between regions that come into play. And that there's a flow in this modern world. That things get exported from one culture to the other. It's not just that we export U.S. culture. I mean, we do that. I remember being in Moscow and seeing the largest McDonald's I've ever seen with lines and lines of people waiting to get in all day long, waiting in line to get into McDonald's on Pushkin Square. I mean, it, I begin to see, you know, you get a sense that we export things, export TV shows and so on. But it, it isn't just that way. I mean, the flow goes in other directions as well. Latin Americans uh, exported liberation theology to a big part of the world. We have Asiatic liberation theology, African liberation theology. 
the whole uh, question of how women uh, are treated in our world um, comes into play. Even in Afghanistan, we think of that uh, amazing movie that was done by a woman from Pakistan who went into that other world and uh, saw how life was going in Afghanistan and begins to create a consciousness of how women are cre treated all over the world. A lot of us do transcendental meditation that we learn from the Hindus. And so it just goes on and on in ways in which even uh, the, the less dominant cultures also feed ideas into us. So there's this interplay goes on. And then not only that, but there's a way in which you begin to create a single culture. Probably the dominant way I think that single culture is, is going to take over more and more is through the fundamental story of science. The Big Bang Theory and 16 billion years of evolution. So that educated people all over the world, in different cultures, different nation states, people who are in touch with modern science, begin to play out that one story of a whole human race that's a product of a 16 billion year evolutionary process. You want to get a good feel for that, read Thomas Berry, The Dream of the Earth. A common story. Some of us know it or in terms of, say, the Olympics, where people all over the globe watch the same events, same time. Think of all the people over the globe who, who empathized with us on September 11th. And we could see television pictures of people in other parts of the world responding to September 11th, an event in our own country. So all of that is a way to try to make concrete uh, this globalization process that um, we more and more live in what McLuhan called that one great village, the global village. And we're conscious of it. You can't get away from it. Shapes our sensibilities more and more. That's the kind of world in which our church is trying to function today and is backdrop for all of this. And there's a final contextual point that um, I want to make, and that is the movement southward of the Christian world. So that this Philip Jenkins has written a book on it, and his article in the Chronicle of Higher Education that some people might have seen. And... Um, you know, he, he extrapolates numbers. I don't know how much to trust those, but he's telling us things like most, you know, the, the this biggest Christian grouping in the whole world will be in Africa by 2025, and second in Latin America, and third in Europe, and fourth in Asia. So that there is a movement to, away from a European-centered understanding of Christianity to one that's rooted in southern cultures, southern hemisphere. He talks about a new Christendom that will be established. He thinks the great linkage will come between Latin America and Africa because they have similar kinds of problems of poverty, because they have similar heritages of uh, being under colonial rule that they're trying to overcome. Well, I have no idea if that is the way it's going, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the dominant center of Christianity, which we've always associated with Europe and with Rome and some ways with the United States, is clearly gone. I suppose you could put it another way and say if we had a third Vatican Council now, the composition of the bishops there would look far different than they did in the 1960s. So that's uh, as I, you know, part of this global context that I want to then try to locate uh, Karl Rahner's understanding of the Second Vatican Council. It's in the context of a postmodern world of globalization and of a movement southward in the whole. Um, centering and predominance of Christianity itself. Well, I'm not sure in this series one has to say a lot about uh, Karl Rahner and his importance. You look back there facing the baptismal font, see the great figure of Rahner. 
and uh, died in 1984. Um, I love to tell the stories. Ronner uh, was a simple, humble man, and uh, some of my great events of my whole life were in his presence and in conversation with him. I always carry with me those memories of a man, uh, volatile as could be, his anger would explode in a few seconds and it would quickly subside, impatient, chain smoker, couldn't drive a car, got younger guys to drive the car faster, faster, pass them, pass them on the hill, pass the truck, living on the edge, just a man of total energy and volatility and immense intellectual capabilities, one of the great theologians in the whole history of the church, and because the great theologians do one thing, they create new paradigms, new total ways of understanding what the Christian message is all about. And you probably only got a hand, couple handfuls of people throughout history who have created a new paradigm, a new way of understanding Christianity in relationship to the culture of the times. A paradigm that other people say, yeah, that makes sense, or I want to study that, or that would guide me, or that would help. People like Origen and Augustine and Aquinas and Luther, Calvin, Schleiermacher and our friend Karl Rahner. And Rahner was, uh, lived in good times. I mean, you become influential, like Augustine, so influential because nothing happened theologically for so long after him. And that his thought was there to dominate the thinking for long periods all the way up to the time of Aquinas. So Rahner caught a break in that sense. Uh, he was around for the Second Vatican Council and had the chance to influence that great meeting. He was a paritas, an expert at the council. That was the brilliance of Pope John XXIII. Before that, Cardinal Ottaviani had uh, gotten a restraint on Rahner that uh, he had to check his stuff out with the Vatican before he published it on the topics of Mary and concelebration. It was uh, one, and he was always like, uh, he made little jokes with the Pope because he was con celebrating a mass with the Pope at the council, reminding him that some of those officials had were condemned him for writing about and promoting con celebration earlier. So he had the chance to lecture to the bishops and to help in writing some of these documents, and he was, even in the minds of his critics, uh, an immense influence on that Second Vatican Council. Not only that, but I would say that he has had immense influence on how to interpret that council afterwards. And fundamentally, what he said in that lecture here in the United States was that the standard interpretation of the council was that, well, John the 23rd was brilliant, and he saw all these movements going on, a scriptural renewal and an ecumenical movement, and uh, new ways of doing theology and scripture studies were flourishing and he saw all that and he brought a council and he brought that all to focus all those movements and sort of the council therefore is this culmination of this wonderful flowering in the 19th and 20th centuries of these great movements and they produced 16 documents out of that that sort of enshrined that great work up till that time that was sort of a standard interpretation of the council. And Rahner gave that lecture and said he thought that was exactly the wrong way to think of the council. The Second Vatican Council wasn't the culmination of things. It was the tiny, tiny beginning of the third, grade, third great era in the history of the church. Tiny, tiny beginning when the church would become conscious of the fact that it was a world church. There was always a world church in potential. It could be that. And there were times when maybe there were little hints of that in the 19th and 20th centuries. But at the Second Vatican Council, the church officially and in a public way, in the highest level of teaching, came to understand, at least in a tiny beginning way, the Catholic Church is not tied to European culture, but it's a world church. 
and needs to be enculturated all over the globe. He said, interesting image, that the way the church understood, and this goes back to Vincent Donovan, the way he was trained, he was trained that what you did was you go to the Maasai tribe and you export European Christianity. You take European Christianity, it's been developed in that cultural setting, and you give it to them or impose it on them. Tell them about it. He called uh, the church functioning as an export firm. That we've got this Christian, Europeanized Christianity and the strategy of the church ever since the beginning was to export that, to spread it, take it around the world. Ronner recognized that this idea of the church being a world church had counter trends. <laughs> I mean, he didn't think the council was just clear. Yeah, it's all we all got it together. Now we're a world church. We're going to act like that, and let's get on with it. No, it was a struggle and terribly ambivalent, and there were forces there that didn't want to accept it, and there's forces today that don't want to accept it. So he talks about the Roman Curia, you know, a centralized bureaucracy. He said harsh words for the Curia often. A oh, centralized bureaucracy that thinks it knows better how to live Christianity and how to understand it than anybody else in the world. That wants to take a Roman understanding of what Christianity is all about and impose it on the rest of the world. It wants to create laws for the rest of the world to live by. Rhonda says, oh, the council has limitations. It's interesting how he even mentions the Maasai tribe in his article. And he says that, you know, there was no African dancing at the liturgies at the Second Vatican Council. Thought that was terrible. And then he says, poses a kind of question, he says, do we have to think in terms of marital morality that an African chieftain has to live by Western standards? Or could not an African chieftain in terms of multiple wives you know, live as did the patriarch Abraham. Well, it's meant to shock his audience a little bit, you know. Of course, in a group like this, it doesn't shocking, but you know, <laughs> people in Weston, you know, they, no, I suppose that question. Would we have? And it was a way of getting at the question of Western standards of understanding Christianity. To what degree do we impose that on the rest of the world? Then he goes on to say in the article. Well, there were a lot of signs at the Second Vatican Council of this rudimentary understanding of the world church. For one thing, there were native bishops there which had not happened in councils before, even in 1870 at the First Vatican Council. You didn't have native bishops there. You might have had missionary bishops from different countries, but not native bishops. So for the first time in all these 21 ecumenical councils, we had native bishops there to uh, represent uh, their people in one way or another. He makes a big thing out of the use of the vernacular so that every culture could begin to celebrate the Eucharist, not in Latin, uh, the language of a tiny elite group of people, but in the language of the people, which opened up the possibility, therefore, for adaptation in the liturgy. He says that the council understood that, we, that the church has a responsibility for shaping the future of the human race. Well, in a sense, uh, it's amazing, this article by Rahner, how all these themes that came out in globalization and enculturation later on are contained in this article that goes way back to the late 1970s. He said the documents, especially when you compare them with the original documents, were written in a Roman theological framework in what we call neo-scholastic language. 
And the Pope, of course, helped, you know, Pope John the Twenty-Third, so brilliant and uh, great in his approach to all this. They, they, the document on Revelation was t unacceptable to a good number of the bishops. Uh, but you had to have a two-thirds vote to get rid of it. And it was written in this Roman mentality, this defensive mentality, this anti-Protestant approach to the question of revelation and neo-scholastic categories that nobody else in the whole world even understands. And Pope John XXIII uh, simply created a new committee, a new commission to write a new document. And they wrote it in a way getting rid of a lot of that Roman baggage and writing it in a way that was much more acceptable to the bishops, to the majority of the bishops, first of all, much more acceptable to our Protestant friends and much more open to the other cultures that would eventually encounter a document like that. And then we have the wonderful things said in the, in the council about the value of other religions. For the first time, a positive assessment of other world religious traditions, something we're emphasizing in the Catholic-Muslim dialogue these days. Great kinship with the Muslims, it says, because we believe in one God, who is the merciful one and the judge of all. Along with our Muslim and Jewish friends, we affirm Abraham as our great father in faith. A great story that affected chief of a Maasai tribe just as much as it might affect us. And then there is the whole salvation optimism found in the Council's remarkable notion in a number of the documents, especially in Lumen Gentium, document of church number 16, that says the only thing that stops us from getting to heaven is the violation of our conscience. Which, of course, uh, Vincent Donovan picked up on that. He says, when he walked away, he talks this story about after a whole, he'd spend one year instructing. That was his limit. Going to instruct a community in one year, and then he's leaving, getting out of there. Modeled himself on Paul, which becomes very important as we go along here. He said, Paul didn't feel he had to reach everybody, got a few key cities, worked on a few key people, and then took off. So Vincent Donovan wanted to, to model himself on Paul that way. So he spent a year and, um, doing with the tribe, and he'd had some success with other groups. And afterwards, he met with them. The question was, you, you know, do you want to be baptized now? And the elders came back and said, no. We've listened, discussed it thoroughly, talked about it, heard you out for a whole year, came every week, they'd meet every week, and no, we don't accept that, and we don't want to be baptized. And Vincent Donovan got up and left and didn't go back. Well, I'd say fundamentally because he had the sense that those people were in the hands of God. He wasn't walking around being afraid they're going to go to hell because I didn't pour water on them. These people follow their conscience, do the best they can. They're in the hands of God. I trust they'll be saved. Enjoy the rewards of heaven. That's what Rahner means by a salvation optimism at work in the world, and in this case, in clearly in Vincent Donovan. Religious liberty was celebrated by the council, ecumenism promoted, all things that helped create this idea that we are a world church. Well, Rana says it's hard to figure out how to divide up church history. You know, we got our usual ways of doing it. There's an early church, and then there was the Hellenistic period, and then the medieval church, and then the Reformation came, and so on, and there was a counter-Reformation, and we had other things happen, like the charismatic movement in the 60s, and so on. So there's a lot of ways of looking at church history. But he says he proposes another way, that there's been three periods in church history. First was the period of Jewish Christianity, in which the gospel was preached within the framework of Israel and two other Jews presented in a holy Jewish fashion. 
That period lasted only a few decades in, in, from at least one perspective. The period, early period was very short. And the second period is pre premier figure would be Paul. So right, Vincent Donovan, again, this is a, such interesting link up, spends a whole lot of time in his book talking about Paul, wanting to model what he did on the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul inaugurates, in Rahner's mind, the new era, the second era. But it's not an exporting of Jewish Christianity to the Gentile world. That isn't what Paul did. He took away the distinctive Jewishness, in a sense, not totally, but he took away circumcision, the obligation to be circumcised, took away the obligations to follow the law, and what he did was bring the core message about Jesus, the Paschal mystery, the death and resurrection of Jesus. I preached Jesus and him crucified. Simple message, just like Vincent Donovan tried to do. And then sort of let it happen. Or another image would be he planted it in pagan soil and it grew there. It's a different thing than exporting. Of saying, here we got this thing here, Jesus, and we got the law and circumcision and dietary matters. Now we're going to give that to the Gentiles. That isn't what he did. He took the core, fundamental paschal mystery, death and resurrection of Jesus, preached it, and then it began to develop in that new setting. And so... Rahner says that period of history lasted all the way up till the Second Vatican Council. Well, and what happened is Christianity got culturally identified with the European world and later with the powerful United States. And all the way of the Christian institutions, the way we talked about the dogmas and doctrines, the way we developed an ascetical life, all grew out of that Western Christian model influenced by Hellenistic culture, by Roman culture, by European outlooks and ways, and by the United States. So that what we ended up thinking is sort of the normative essence of Christianity is the Europeanized Christianity that we know here in this world, that we know in our own lives, growing up, what's been passed on to us. And, of course, we treasure that. No, it's in our bones and blood, many of us. It's the way we see the world. It's the grid through which we deal with reality. We bet our lives on that Jesus that's taught in that framework. No, it's, it means everything to us. It's the vision of the world. It's uh, what we're used to. It's the custom. We come here to Mass. We expect to be out in an hour. And it always runs the same way. It's in one place. Vincent Donovan, he wasn't really sure where it was taking place. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the compound of the Messiah tribe. You know, well, it some, some of it was going on over here and some was dancing over there and they're singing over there and passing the grass over there. I mean, it's, we come here and we do it. Place, it's familiar. So, that Europeanized Christianity or distinctive American version of Catholicism that we know becomes part of us. But what Rahner wants us to see is it's not normative. It's not the only way. Pope John XXIII said that before the council started. Christianity is not tied to any one culture even, not even tied to European culture. Not tied to it. So that in this next great stage, the model to be followed in Rahner's mind is Paul, or concretely, Vincent Donovan, who tried to take the core message and give it to a new people and avoid at all costs the European overlay. He constantly says, I didn't want to introduce this custom with the sacrament because 
it might have a different meaning to them. And it might influence the way they see it. So he tried every Like when he celebrated the Eucharist, I mean, he, all he did was, he, he said, well, I'm doing what the Lord said to do. Take the bread and wine that's his body and blood given for us and sharing it with you. That's how he celebrated the Eucharist. Now you figure out what it means. You figure out how we'll deal with this and how we'll uh, translate it into our culture. So that's Rahner's idea. The great model is what happened with uh, the uh, Apostle Paul and how he went about all of that. And something like that, Rahner, to happen in our own time. He sort of throws in a pragmatic point. He says, the other approach hasn't worked. We're developing, we've made no impact on the Islamic world. We blew the chance to make an impact on China. The story of Matteo Ricci is the counter story in all this. Matteo Ricci, a great Jesuit uh, missionary who did the same thing that Vincent Donovan did back in the 17th century when he died, 1610, I think, Ricci. And um, the, uh, he, he went to China, he got worked into the upper classes, learned the language, learned the culture, and presented to them the Christian story, and with great help with them came up with translations of the scriptures and rituals for them to follow, a way of being Christian, and that was suppressed by the Vatican. Probably why we've got you know, this large one fourth of the population today is not Christian because of that suppression of this brilliant. Ricci's got to be the most brilliant missionary in history of the church, that one of the most, and uh, suppressing that whole enculturation that he tried to do. So Ronner says we haven't done too well around the world and now's the time to move forward and he says if we're going to do that he recognizes a great problem and everyone probably senses this it's what's the core <laughs> you know what what's the core of all this and what Ronner will say is that there is no core that's not culturally conditioned you can't have that there is no fundamental understanding of the faith that can be abstracted from the language it's put in, from the symbols it's expressed in, from the cultural setting that gives rise to it. You can't have that. But what he wants us to do as much as possible is to get at the core of what it's all about, what the message is. And he thinks it's vitally important that various cultures and various people try to distill that and state it for themselves. Thus. Rahner's great emphasis on short creeds. The great invitation is to write your own short creed and try to get at what is the essence of the faith for you. If you teach sophomores in high school, write a short creed for sophomores. Write a short creed for collegians. Oh, something that tries to say in their language what the essence of the faith is all about. Well, I mean, there's some things, you know, it's, essence of the faith has not got something to do with purgatory. No, I mean, that's, some things are pretty clear. You can't have an essence of the faith without the Paschal mystery, death and resurrection of Jesus. However it is, you're going to interpret it, talk about it. So it is a great theological problem that um, needs to be worked at, but Rahner's solution to it is that all cultures try to devise a statement of that core essence of what Christianity is all about. And those various efforts then come into dialogue. You talk to one another about it. You have a conversation about what we think the core is and how you say it and how I say it and how the Messiah say it. And he said that will enrich all of us and help us to know how to go about all of this effort of spreading the faith. We talk about all of that under the heading these days of enculturation. 
enculturation is the in term we use today. Take the faith and um, to let it enter into dialogue with the culture so that there will be an interplay in which the core of the faith influences the culture like better treatment of women in the Maasai tribe and in which the culture begins to enrich one's understanding of the faith itself. Donovan thought that he learned a lot about how to talk about Jesus from the Maasai tribe. Well, from his age, was from a tribe, the tribe of Judah, and they insisted on calling him a man. They didn't do much of this God stuff, but they did a lot with him as the man and um, this figure that they could look up to, strong figure. So there's an interplay between the two. That's what enculturation tries to bring about. The expression on each side is then influenced by that correlation of the two. Now, I think there, there are a lot of implications of what Rahner's talking about. Um, one has to do with how we think of the universal church and the local church. Dr. Gallardi could uh, talk all day on this question, and I will just uh, say a few words about it. For Rahner, but I contrasted, first of all, with another viewpoint held by Cardinal Ratzinger. The Cardinal Ratzinger would put a primacy on the universal church. That sort of exists first and is most important. And that it then, the universal church, gets concretized or embodied in different local churches, like the Church of Toledo. For Rahner, you begin to get an inversion of that. Rahner is very taken with the theology of the local church. The local church is where it's all at. Church of Toledo's got it all. All seven sacraments, the uh, successor to the apostles, all the teaching, it's all here, right in the Church of Toledo. And along with the church in Cleveland, with all the dioceses around the world, we form a great communion of churches. A universal church. It's the way the Easterners tend to think about the church. And Rahner is very influenced by that. So Rahner puts, a, he thinks that you can't have one without the other, they go together. But he puts great primacy on thinking about the local church. And this is where it's real. I mean, I think about collegians. I mean, where's the church real for them? Right here at Corpus Christi. It's where they get their sense of it, what it's all about. They get their teaching, celebrate the liturgy. That's where it's real. Rahner has this interesting dream that he talks about of the church. And I think I'm coupling this with some things that he told me himself. Um, Rahner dreams of a future in which the Pope is not really all that bright. Or, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Where the, Pope, where the Pope does not think he knows the answer to everybody's question. And in his dream, he sees the Pope sitting at a round table with representatives of other religious traditions at a round table and uh, entering into dialogue, genuine dialogue with them, learning from them as well as offering his own insights. Um, be interesting to see when the cardinals elect a new pope how much this idea of a world church comes into play. That is a church in which local hierarchies have power, where the national hierarchies don't have to get everything they do approved from Rome, where if they want to think it's best to have confession after First Communion, that they can do it without Rome telling them, no, you can't do it. My own sense is in electing the next pope, there's going to be a lot of cardinals who are going to say, I don't want Rome telling us when to have the sacrament of confession for our kids. I don't want that. I want the power in our group to make that decision. I think it will, the world church thing will come into play heavily when in the electing of the new pope. And we'll see 
greater importance given to the national conferences of bishops, I think. Greater liturgical adaptation. I mean, boy, what does the Eucharist look like in the Maasai tribe, you know? Uh, Rome did suppress that, by the way. A little addenda to the story that gives some bite to the lecture. <laughs> Importance of dialogue. Very important as we go along to carry on the Christian Muslim dialogue. A lot of other things that we have to deal with. Um, I think that all of this, this whole idea of the world church, greater autonomy for local churches, you know, developing their own canon law. Rahner says that in light of historical developments, this papacy and the actions of this curia will be seen to be totally anachronistic that is out of touch with the times that attempt to centralize and control things out of Rome will be seen as simply not the way it ought to happen and people will look back on this period as out of tune with the movement towards the world church as a counter trend to it well for people who happen to think that local autonomy is good and are for progressive reforms in the church and who want to keep the spirit of Vatican II alive, that outlook can come as good news and as a great sign of hope to keep up the struggles to work for that kind of reform in the church. So Rahner, one of his great contributions becomes this idea for the first time in history, in a tiny little way, Second Vatican Council made public and explicit what was true of Christianity from the very beginning, that it is a world religion, that this is a world church that has a message for everybody on our globe and can make an impact on every culture. Let's take our usual couple minute break and then we'll be present for comments, rebuttals, challenges, questions. Philip Jenkins? I don't know. Might have been. I wouldn't doubt it. One of, one of the points that it made was that in the Southern Hemisphere and in China and these other places, that religion is still a fundamentalist yeah. uh, religion. That's Jenkins, yeah. That Jenkins, where? Well, I mean, I mean, it's his idea. And that it's the new. More conservative. Yeah, except if we have autonomy in developing countries. I mean, that's why you should ordain women in the United States. You can't ordain them in the Maasai tribe. That's the solution to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have your attention, please? Um, we'll uh, start again. Uh, microphones do we not so if you raise your hand somebody will get you a microphone please uh, speak up into the mic r directly into it will this work okay uh, you want my name 
Not necessary. Okay, so anyway, it's Lou Mahali, and we're from Findlay, and thank you for a fine lecture. Uh, the thought that, that I had as you described these uh, church, like the Church of Toledo, the Church of Cleveland, are many of our Protestant brethren do that. And uh, it, it, they, I, I guess the Catholic fear might be that uh, somehow or other we will dilute the fundamental faith if we allow this to happen. Therefore, in order to make sure everybody has the same formula, we can't let that happen. And uh, as I see it, that would be the uh, obstacle to uh, you know, moving along on that path, which to me seems to be a great idea. But anyway. That's uh, well stated and probably could be amplified in terms of then the great problem of um, fragmentation, which is largely happened in the Protestant community. No, so the, the great challenge, I think whichever way you come at this, whether you start with the universal church or start with the local church, you're going to see a problem. It's the same way in all uh, church matters, theological matters. You start with the divinity of Jesus, you're pretty safe there, you might lose his, his humanity. Start with his humanity, you're in great shape, but might lose his divinity. So the, the problem always in thinking th these things through theologically is to keep the dialect dialectical tension, in this case between the universal and the particular. So there is a mutual interplay. The great danger in all dialectical approaches is to lose one or the other side of the polarity. Well, so you're big on the humanity of Jesus, you forget he's God. Well, you got a problem. You're not in the mainstream and so on. The same way here, the local church has to um, remember always that it's part of a larger church. It's part of the universal church and needs to be responsive to that church. And so, you know, it, you know, we're so tilted the other way that, you know, it's hard to imagine the problem that, as you're suggesting it, you know, but if it ever did over decades move the other way, then we'd have to hear a lot of sermons on staying in touch with Rome, you know. <laughs> you'd have to hear a lot of that. So, because the danger would be to lose the uh, side of, other side of the dialectic. But, you know, my reading of it is it's so balance the other way. I mean, just look at this local case now. Rome is sitting there deciding whether they're going to approve what our bishops did or not. Now, I mean, you can argue that two ways. They could save the bishops from the mistakes made at Dallas. The latest news report says they're not going to do that. But, um, you know, I mean, you could think of, of the values, you know, and that set of, of a transnational church. And they're immense values having a transnational church, having a, a someone outside our own culture saying, hey, you people are too consumerist. You know, you people are too individualistic. You got to shape up. I mean, that's great. We, we have to have that kind of interplay. But on the other hand, you know, sit around our bishops and all the time and they're waiting to see if Rome's going to approve this thing they did or not. Or they can't do anything as a national hierarchy now and accomplish much of anything because it's got to have a unanimous vote, isn't it right? Unanimous vote by the bishops to get approval. <laughs> well, you can't get all those bishops in the United States to agree on anything. So uh, you, 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 that, that hamstrings them. They can't do anything effectively. You know, one of the Muslim brothers was telling me the other day, why don't the bishops speak out in Iraq? He says, I know why they don't speak out in Iraq, because they're, they're all worried about this sex abuse thing. And they've lost their moral authority. You know, so I mean, it's just, as I see it, the balance is so much the other way right now that that's hardly a fear in the United States in terms of us losing contact with Rome. Our problem is to get a little freedom in relationship to Rome, to be able to figure out how we're going to live out the Christian message here. But we always need to critique, it's wonderful. Speaking of the commitment to keeping things in dialectical tension, I'm struck by the fact that uh, at first glance, Rahner doesn't want to do that with his interpretation of Vatican II. At least you said that he dismissed that standard interpretation that the council is sort of drawing together movements that were below the surface. And I wonder whether that's a good example of both and rather than either or. I mean, I think on the question of a world church and enculturation, the council genuinely did do something new that there wasn't a lot going on in that before the council. But in other areas, the council, I think, clearly was 
building on movements that were going on. And the, the two slogans at the council, you know, aggiornamento speaks to that sense of something genuinely new happening, but ressourcement also refers to that drawing on things that were happening in the past. So it seems to me Rahner's interpretation is a little non-dialectical itself. Yeah. I, I would say that uh, you got a little slanted version of Rahner from the speaker. Uh, <laughs> As you well know, uh, the article itself um, does not spend a lot of time debunking the other side of this thing. <laughs> um, that's more of a rhetorical flourish, I would say, to make the point. I, I, I think that Rahner himself um, keeps that dialectic between the tradition and the change almost always in mind. I would see him as being great with that and almost totally consistent in my reading of him. Some of his interpreters get carried away, however, and move uh, his thought <laughs> in a more radical direction. No, I, I mean, for me, I mean, the way I commonly say that, it, it's to try to, to make the point that what he's proposing here was, uh, in a sense, in the late 70s, something radically new and just struck people and continues to strike people. You'll read more and more theological eyes who will begin with, well, as Rahner said about the world church. And so it's just a striking thing. But I, I believe on that specific point, and in general, Rahner is, keeps the dialectic between change and, and conserving the tradition pretty much in order. Do you picture how Donovan presented the gospel and Jesus in Africa? How might you, in our culture, which has a lot of unchurched, uh, a lot of people who may not have any faith sense that looks in the same way, how would you present it here? I mean, we're in a okay. city where the churches are empty, yeah. but people live all around them. Yeah, um, I try to learn from my students that way when we do the Christian leader, the contemporary theology class. Uh, we always have a segment where we, uh, you know, I try to listen to them to see how they tend to, to see all of this. I, I notice that one of the images, and our Jesuit friends do such a great job with this, uh, talking about Jesus as the man for others. Um, that, uh, the, the servant of others, I, I find that often resonates. I mean, I think that within our own culture, uh, what you would want to build on is um, the positive feelings about Jesus' message of love. So there's many people who, and young people, who like that message of tolerance, of understanding, of forgiveness. I mean, they like the prodigal son story. They like the story of a woman taken in adultery, the way Jesus deals with her compassionately. They like his sense of service to others. They see him as a high ethical teacher. You know, we got Jesus Christ superstar. We've got um, a lot of cultural ways of talking about Jesus that uh, we, can, we can look at. Um, so, and, and often, I mean, they center on uh, the humanity of Jesus and they center on those virtues that our young people tend to treasure many ways of tolerance and openness and and service I mean that's commonly not though but I I see that in the young people I deal this sense of service so when we talk about Jesus as the servant of others the man for others I think that often resonates so as always it's what's the beginning point but I can tell you what I would do in any grouping, apart from going in and doing that, is I would do what Vincent Donovan tried to do to begin with, and that is, what say you? What say you about Jesus? Who do you say that I am? You know, and to try to get a feel for that particular group. I mean, I'm sure if you're in a group of, uh, of middle class young people, it sounds different than if you're in a minority grouping. I'm sure you know, you know, I mean, we'd have young people that would resonate with, uh, if I meet God, I'm going to put a spear through them. Because they're unhappy with their lives, you know, they're unhappy with what's going on. So I would try to go with that. And then, it's always then, 
filling out the picture and most often getting the dialectical point into the mix. So that Jesus Christ is not just an ethical teacher, not just a nice guy who went around talking about love. You know, for us, he's the son of God. He's uh, the wisdom of the Father. He's, uh, you know, he's the definitive prophet and the absolute Savior. All the ways of trying to get at the other side of the dialectic that he's not just one more fellow walking around saying, be nice to people. And, and I'll tell you another way at it. There's an interesting book by um, Charles Taylor, a Canadian philosopher, wrote a wonderful book on the sources of the self, but he also wrote a smaller book on called The Ethics of Authenticity. And he makes a big point in thinking about our young people today that there is a strong moral code among our young people to be authentic. Now, you talk a lot about what does that mean and so on, but to be authentic, not to be hypocritical. And he thinks that's one of the strongest elements to be found in the youth culture today or the kind of collegians I deal with. I want to be an authentic person. I don't want to be hypocritical. I want to be integrated somehow you know, so I can stand myself. So I, I don't have to feel guilty, so I don't have to disappoint myself. And I, I would play a lot on that uh, G, uh, notion of Jesus as the authentic person, the one who kept it together, who said, forgive your enemies, and when crunch time ca came, said, Father, forgive them. You know, right down the line that you can see the actions match the words. And I would make that a major part of presentation to our young people today on Jesus. Authenticity, the authentic one. Or uh, there's another element of it that, um, about maturity. Our young people have a great desire to be mature, to grow up, to get beyond childish ways, to get their head and heart together, to be more effective persons. And I like to talk about Jesus as the mature one, the best that we've produced. The best that we've produced in this whole 16 billion year history. The one who had it together better than anybody else. The one who, you know, knew what he was about more clearly and lived it out more faithfully. The mature one, the authentic one. So it'd be some of the directions I would go in and talking about uh, Jesus with the young people. Oh, don't let me off that easily. <laughs> Father? When we consider the church's efforts to be sensitive to different and varied cultures, and we, as part of the European church, if you will, are not our commandments, our uh, sacraments, our sacramentals, our icons, all subject to dismissal because they might offend another culture's sensitivities. Well, I'm assuming everyone heard you since I did. Uh, I, I think the answer to that fundamentally is this pluralism of local churches, this pluralism of inculturations of the core message, and those cultures being taken seriously. Ours deserves to be taken as seriously as anybody else's, as the Messiah tribe or anybody else. We have a distinctive understanding of the Christian faith here in the United States, and um, we should treasure that, play it up, pass it on. Give it to the next generation. It would just be the same mistake to think, well, we ought to act like the Maasai tribe does something, or the way the Southern Hemisphere is going to see it. You know, and this is going to come back to, you know, if Jenkins is right, then what comes out of the Southern Hemisphere is going to be far more conservative and commonly orthodox than we would be used to in progressive Catholic circles in the United States. That is, if some of the southern 
countries begin to send priests here, and that's probably what will happen. You know, we are going to, and this is, this is not uh, just a proposed scenario, this is happening, um, where the priests coming from other countries often strike the people in this country, in this culture, as being out of step with the things we've come to accept. Well, I've given talks to diocesan presbyterates, the priests and dioceses, and where the bishop will warn me ahead of time, he says, well, I got these priests from other countries, and they're really not interested in, uh, in trying to understand our culture. You know, they come here and they, they want to do it like they did it in Poland, or in Nigeria, or wherever else they're coming from. So, in a sense, your question, I mean, it can get broadened out to be a really difficult problem for us in the future. I mean, unless we get this priest thing straightened out, we're going to keep functioning by getting priests from the rest of the world. They're going to be the missionaries to us. We aren't going to have enough priests. We don't have enough priests now. And, and as I say, most dioceses that I go talk in, they all got some priests from other countries and are trying to figure out how to get them one way or another to be uh, enculturated here to be a part of our own culture. So uh, the, the beauty of this approach is that we, we treasure and value the distinctiveness of all of the incarnations of Christianity. And we learn from one another, but we don't give up what's crucial to us and what we carry and what we treasure. And, and, and that's, you know, well, I use that one example, I mean, of uh, we, we are heavily influenced by psychology in this country. And out of that influence, our bishops came to the outlook that it was better to have kids make their first confession after they made their first communion. That this would be pastorally a very good thing to do. And it would help them grow up more mature ways and not be so guilt-ridden. It would just be a great thing. And, and that's in our culture, it's just natural because of our influence of the therapeutic culture and the world of psychology and so on. And, and well, Rome took that away from us. And it caused great problems. I mean, I happen to know between individual priests and their bishop. Priests who had moved in another direction. So, I mean, that's already happening where people take away what it seems to be valuable and good in the distinctive expression of American Catholicism as we know it. Got a mic? Yeah. Could you uh, reverse the uh, separation of the local church and Rome by organizing the church by continent, for example, starting to bring about a, a balance by organizing the Catholic Church in Asia, Europe, United States, mm -hmm. et cetera? I, I think to some degree that happens. All the Asian bishops get together for an Asian conference. All the African bishops, as diverse as they are because of coming from different tribal settings and so on, get together in an African conference. Our American bishops get together. Experience of bishops in Latin America is quite different. There are times when they all get together, but their experience seems to be so distinct. So my um, way of organizing would be not according to geography, continental, but according to uh, cultural regions, where cultural regions would be together. So there'd be a lot of reasons why United States and Canadian bishops could get together on particular things. And I've been involved in some of those dialogues in the past that seem to me to be quite fruitful between American and, and uh, Canadians. Um, you know, it would seem like you got quite a different cultural setting in Latin America, which would dictate them going in other directions. So, I, I, yeah, I think that, that's good. That would be helpful and strengthening. But the problem is you got a Roman bureaucracy that doesn't want power dispersed that way. And uh, I, I, I believe that will be a crucial issue in the mind of the electors for the next pope. Well, 
You know, I mean, when you think of our own distinctive uh, American experience, uh, just to uh, springboard that, and in a sense it's back to Paul's point as well, um, the distinctive way that our sense of the separation of church and state and of religious liberty, our constitutional form of government, worked its way into the universal church, that's a very striking story. In other words, our distinctive experience of saying, hey, it works. We don't have to be privileged in this country. All we got to have is freedom and the church flourishes and we give freedom to the others and that works well and we're doing great with it. We were able to sell it to the rest of the bishops around the world. Thus, we have the, one of the 16 documents on religious liberty, which essentially enshrines elements of our own separation of church and state as we, as we know it in this country. So we did it, take something good in our country and export it. Someone else has got the microphone. You're next. <laughs> Why don't you give the gentleman a microphone, Josie? So people can hear you. Into it, yeah. When you alluded to the fact that uh, uh, priests from other cultures are coming here, I think there was a little bit of uh, uh, it didn't jive with the fact of uh, the real fact of multiculturalism in this country because if those priests uh, are approved by the lay people of the culture that they within our American culture that that they serve and you consider the fact that lay people uh, with, with your, your uh, ideology should have a greater uh, say-so, it sort of contradicts the fact that this culture that you're talking about approve of this, uh, uh, the, the, the lay people supporting that particular uh, parish or whatever it is, uh, uh, let me uh, go with that, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I do, yeah. I, 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 first of all, I would um, definitely support the idea. I mean, you've got Korean communities out in Los Angeles, and you have a Korean priest taking care of them. This is terrific. You know, this is great. It's just like when the Germans came here, they got German priests to take care of them. And the Italians did the same. All the ethnic groups that came to the United States got their parishes started in that same way. They'd look for a priest who spoke their language and understood their culture. So I'm all in favor of that. And, you, and you've got, you know, like in Los Angeles, where well, they speak 50 different languages or something. I, they, and they need that. So I, I'm all in favor of that. The problem comes in if you've got a progressive suburban parish in um, Chicago and uh, you send in a, a priest from Nigeria who doesn't want women to be anywhere near the altar, you got a problem. That's where the problem comes in. I mean, this isn't abstract. It's, that's what happens. So th this is difficult. So the guy from Nigeria has either got to learn how women are to be treated in the United States, you know, or else he's probably doing more harm than good. Probably better off without him ministering in that parish. So that, I mean, it's just real concrete. Yeah, if you got a mix, a fit, great, go with it, and we can help, helps us out. Uh, Josie, you get last chance. I'm just reflecting on uh, uh, our own culture and what's happening right now. You've already commented about the fact that uh, the bishops may have not had a lot to say about Iraq right now, perhaps because they're distracted by um, other political problems, but I'm wondering if it's more than that. We've been waiting a long time, and they have finally, you know, uh, written a letter to, to Bush, but um, the Catholic in the pew doesn't hear about this, really, unless they happen to read the Chronicle. Uh, they're not going to know that, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if our, as a, as a Catholic in the pew, I would like to see more of, of teaching from the local church, not just the pastor, which is kind of haphazard, but from our local bishops directly to us, either through, uh, 
one, one example would be through, through the church bulletin. But at any rate, letting us know about their teachings. In the past, they certainly um, issued many letters as a body, as a national conference, but I still don't feel in the pews that I'm receiving the benefit of their teaching. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with their concept of, of, of being turned more toward Rome and not, not feel, if perhaps they don't feel their responsibility toward in, interpreting our culture, our, our culture yeah. right now of, of war for us. I, I feel like I'm on my own. Uh, very good points you make, Josie. I, I would just point to the fact that um, we should remember that our bishops in the 1980s produced those wonderful pastoral letters on the economy and on peace. They did it with tremendous courage, with great wisdom. It was a nightline. I mean, they got news constantly on that. Big press reports, Maggie the Time, Newsweek, on those, on those things because they kept rewriting the draft. Some of us were hoping they never wrote the final draft. You know, because every time they wrote it, we got a new uh, surge of publicity. And uh, the, the moral message was out there for us. So, and, and, I, and I find, I think that stance they took on questions of war in the peace pastoral in the 80s was probably as courageous as any national hierarchy in history that I can think of. And uh, so they deserve a lot of credit. I mean, they stood up and took a lot of flack and, and, and put themselves in a vulnerable position. I, I mean, right now, you know, we got this Iraq situation is just, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what they've said. Did they do something today or something? Or, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm aware of almost nothing they've said about Iraq. And I, I mean, I think the, the, the message I'm getting from people is they, they're looking for it. I suspect they won't do anything. Am I right until November when they're together? If they're going to do anything on Iraq? I'm looking to Rick or Shannon. I can't imagine them coming out with a document tomorrow, but um, I don't know. But the timing, I mean, yeah, we need moral leadership right now. And let's face it, a lot of pastors hide behind that. I mean, if the bishops made a big statement, then we feel free to get up and say, well, the bishops said the just war uh, calculus rules out an attack on Iraq. Then pastors are more likely to get up and say that. Uh, but to get up uh, on our own without that cover or that, um, not just cover, without that uh, teaching, without that important teaching, which has greater weight, obviously, than any individual pastor or theologian has, um, we, that, that would be welcome. So, I mean, I think a lot of us are looking for what do we do about this Iraqi situation? I mean, I, we're in our parish, we've got to figure out what are we going to do? Oh, we got parishioners who are uh, ahead of us and are out writing letters and very fine letters to to Congress people and so on. So it's um, I mean, I, I just I, the, our bishops have done great things. I mean, I don't want to lose the fact. The 80s, I was proud of them. They were great. They were courageous. They were wise, and they made good distinctions. Those were great letters, and um, I think a lot of us are looking for it now. Can they mobilize now? I, it's commonly said, I've heard bishops personally tell me this, there is a vacuum of leadership. I mean, we don't have a Cardinal Bernardine who, who can really take the lead in that and make that happen. We don't have that. I always said when Bernardine died, he was irreplaceable. I mean, no one's irreplaceable, but he was in terms of he had power, he had wisdom, he had, was a great spiritual person. You know, and uh, he was willing to speak out. I mean, he had a platform. I mean, Bishop Utner in Saginaw might want to say something, but no one's going to listen to him like they did. I, we have to go. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Thank you.